Um, so I'll keep the slide in the background, but I'll also introduce our first speaker, Dominic um, and Annabelle. Um, so Dominic Campanella is the co-founder of Restado and Conculaire. Uh, Restado is the largest marketplace for reclaimed construction materials, and Conculaire is the digital platform for circular construction. Both platforms access the challenges of resource efficiency in the construction industry, as resources are responsible for 50% of the greenhouse gas emissions in the sector. Annabel von Reuten is responsible for business development and partnerships at Conculaire. She has a background as an architect and gathered several years of experience in sustainable construction processes. Um, Dominic and Annabel, um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you a lot, uh, Justin. Um, is it possible to share my AR? Yeah, perfect, I think. Okay, let me know if you can see my... Yep. Okay, perfect. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Justin. Thank, uh, thanks also that Paul for the introduction and this uh, very important topic, and also for everyone uh, joining today to get to more um, uh, to get to more about circular construction. Um, also, very quick introduction uh, about uh, myself. I am one of the co-founders of Concola and Entrestado, exactly. And uh, Concola is actually the digital ecosystem for the circular built environment, or at least what what we what we are uh, naming it and so I will use around 15 minutes to give you like a brief presentation about what we are actually doing at Concola and also what kind of projects uh, we already executed and also very happy that Juliette is also here today uh, so she will be after uh, she will do the presentation after me and um, uh, about the transformer circular house where we also support uh, them but uh, you will get to know more about that later. So I think the initial question actually is, why do we actually need circular construction? And um, as you all uh, work in this area, um, you might know that the construction sector is the largest polluter in the world. So there, there's a lot of things where the construction sector is number one, uh, at least in, in terms of waste production. So 60% of all global waste is coming from the construction sector, as well as of GHG emissions. So 40% of GHG emissions are directly related to the construction sector. And what was done so far is to really look at energy efficiency uh, of buildings. So how can we reduce the energy needed, for example, for heating in the maintenance um, phase of a building? However, when, uh, when you really look into the data and where CO2 is produced, you can see that, um, or if you divide it actually in the construction and the maintenance phase, you can see that in the past, um, most of the CO2 emissions or GHG emissions were uh, emitted in the, in the construction phase, but already today, half of it is actually emitted before the building is even finished. So before someone is uh, even using the building, 50% of emissions are already emitted, and in the future it will be even more. And um, that's a huge issue which is untackled so far. And the main reason for that is actually the so-called take-make-waste model of construction materials. So right now, resources are extracted from our environment. Uh, construction materials are produced. And then after, and then of course, built into a building. And then after the lifetime of a building and not of the material, these materials are wasted and landfilled and in the best case, downcycled. Um, and on the same spot, a new building is built with new construction material. And maybe you notice there, there's, there's a link missing. So we, we take materials which can be actually reused, uh, landfill them and uh, produce new materials to, put, to very often build something which uh, is very similar to what was there before with new materials and new resources. So the reuse rate uh, right now is therefore only 1% um, in, in, in Germany, but also in Europe. And uh, that's why we think, uh, we, yeah, we think that we have to shift our focus from the energy to the resource efficiency to really tackle, tackle the issues in the construction sector. And this is not only our belief, uh, this is also the belief of a lot of different stakeholders. Um, so we can see on the political landscape um, that there is more and more um, uh, legislation coming in terms of uh, reuse of materials like the 
taxonomy for green finance or the circular economy action plan, but also local laws like in, in, in Berlin, there's the Abfallwirtschaftsgesetz, which was um, uh, for a couple, uh, a couple of weeks ago um, launched and also some societies come up like the Architects of Future, which are very strong in Germany and uh, which, for example, were successful in signing a petition in the Deutsche Bundestag with more than 60,000 signatures uh, for a more uh, resource efficient uh, construction sector. And as well, there are startups coming up. Startups who are challenging the current players and who, who believe that and they can do it better. And um, of course, we also think that we can challenge the status quo with our startup. And that brings me actually to our vision. So our vision is actually to uh, make the construction sector resource and CO2 neutral. So a really huge vision uh, and ambitious one. And we think we can reach the mission uh, by a one-to-one -one substitution of construction materials. So we believe that if you build something new, then you should have the choice uh, between taking a new material or a reclaimed material in the same quality, in the same price, but with that which is saving CO2, waste and resources. And this is basically what we want to reach with Concola, as we as already said, described as an additional ecosystem for circular construction, where we want to make reuse easy, profitable and measurable. But now very long introduction, what is actually Concola? So Concola is basically a software. So with that, we first start actually uh, in the existing buildings. And here, the biggest challenge is that we don't know what materials are in existing buildings. Because documentation is very often very bad, and there are no nice BIM models of uh, buildings which are already there for 20, 30, 40 years. So what we have to do is we have to digitize materials in these buildings. And this is basically what you can do with our software. So you can, um, you or a team of us can go through your building uh, and uh, can digitize the materials uh, using so-called material passports and with that put it in our software and then if there is a demolition or a deconstruction or something uh, um, happening with the materials you can say that these materials are getting free uh, at this certain time uh, um, at this certain date and then what our software is doing because it connects on the other side architecture offices and uh, uh, yeah, uh, other actors of the planning process of the new building. And they can see then what materials are getting free um, and can match that with the, the projects they are planning. So basically we are matching then the supply of reclaimed materials with the demand of it. But um, that only uh, uh, solves uh, some issues. There's also challenges that um, there's a lot of steps um, needed to get the material from the demolition to the new construction site. And this is what you can also manage on our platform. So for example, of course, the deconstruction, the transportation, the refurbishment, uh, the recertification, all these steps, which are sometimes quite complex, can be managed on our platform. So that it's really easy for an architect who's planning a new building to select the right materials. And what's also very important is, of course, to really also measure how much CO2 can we save by reusing materials instead of uh, using new materials? And so to, uh, to explain the process again uh, on, on, on this graph, so as I said, there, there is a plan deconstruction. Normally we go into the building uh, around a year, but you, uh, before demolition happens, but uh, we can also do this uh, much earlier or also um, uh, much, um, much more to the uh, date of deconstruction. So you can see a team of us who's in a building and so we can use our software on a smartphone and then be taking photos and so on and put uh, that all in the digital inventory. You can see here how a material is looking at that is in this digital inventory. So that is like a fire risk in store from Hermann. Uh, you can see all the data. Sometimes you also have VIM models and you can see that the store is four times in that building. And you can also see uh, how much CO2 do you save by reusing that door and also a lot of um, information about how easy can you deconstruct it and so on. And um, 
also then you can aggregate actually um, the CO2 savings, but also uh, what is also very interesting, of course, is the financial aspect. So by reusing materials, especially on, on the demolition side, you save money because you don't have demolition costs and you get money for the materials which you sell before you had to pay for them. So that's also an incentive uh, for a lot of building owners to do that. And so we can also calculate how much money can you actually save with that, but then also what uh, materials are in your building and how much CO2 can you, if you sell, resell everything, uh, actually save. And as I said, on the other side, there are planners and they can select on the materials and we match um, the supply and demand and then take care about all the steps necessary. In that case, for, for example, this door would be now, is now in Berlin, it would be deconstructed in June, refurbished in June, and then delivered to the new construction site in July. So from the projects we did so far, we see uh, that we can save up to 30% of deconstruction costs. It depends a bit on the building type. So uh, uh, let's say an office building, which is uh, 15 or 20 years old with a lot of good interior, of course, has more values than a very old building um, with a lot of toxic materials. And then uh, also we can increase the building value of new buildings by using uh, reclaimed materials because um, of course like uh, you reusing materials is also part of certifications like uh, dg and b and with that you can uh, increase the building value but it also tells the story right if you can use materials which were already like 40 years in another building you can also tell a story around that material which is very exciting and of course you can save a lot of co2 because basically the production phase of materials is zero percent and with that and that is normally the phase where the most co2 is uh, emitted so with that you don't have any co2 emissions um, except of of course like transportation or refurbishment um, so we started with concola uh, around two years ago but uh, we are not completely new to that field um, with Restado, we already building we are also working since eight years in this area and so with Restado, we built the largest market based for reclaimed materials. And maybe to explain what is the difference between Restado and Concola. So Concola is really catered to professional actors and to uh, larger projects and um, also the complete process of uh, getting the materials from demolition to the new construction site. With Restado, we are targeting more like uh, small construction companies and also DIY. and. Um, there you um, you have to take care uh, um, for about pickup and, and so on. So that is more like catered to them. But we can also use Restado um, again also as a secondary sales channel for the materials we, we don't sell on Concola. And of course, a lot of experience from Restado um, is in, in, in Concola. Uh, so for example, calculating how much a material is worth on the secondary market this, this is data no one else has, and we can calculate that. Um, this is just one example of, of a lot of benefits of having like these bo both uh, platforms. Also some companies we're working with, so we're working with architecture offices, quite well-known architecture offices uh, in, in Germany, uh, project developers, but also cities, because of course for cities, that is also very uh, important to decarbonize their environment. Um, Right now, we are focusing on projects um, only in Germany, uh, but we are also, of course, uh, already talking to uh, stakeholders in other countries. Um, and in Germany, we basically uh, do projects in every larger city. And um, also to explain a bit more like uh, on real life projects what we do, uh, in that case, uh, in Germering, so Germering is nearby Munich, there is a um, uh, a mall which was built 20 years ago and uh, what we did was uh, to go into that mall, digitize the materials and sell uh, these materials and so the mall will be demolished uh, next month and uh, so far we sold more than actually 40% uh, but right now I think we had 50% of the materials uh, which is quite good. And also that's a very exciting project, but it's a more like a more individual project. In that case, there's uh, on the top uh, left a school in Aachen. So this school was built in the 50s and it's consisting of 100,000 tiles uh, at bricks. Uh, and um, 
So here on that, that will be all demolished and there will be new uh, residential buildings built on that. And so the idea was to take these bricks, cut them into four and then put them as, a, uh, as facing bricks on the new buildings. And um, so what we did was to uh, define the whole project and the possibility, uh, ecological, but like in general, the possibility, but also economically, if, that is, uh, is this, if this is possible. So we went there, we uh, put down some uh, of, the, of the bricks, we uh, measured the time, how long does it take uh, to, to cut the bricks, but also um, uh, how many uh, bricks are getting destroyed in the process and so on. And, to, and also what is needed to get a recertification for the bricks. Uh, to be able to be allowed in the end also to put on the new building. And so we did all the pros, uh, process so that in, in the end, uh, it's, uh, that we can say now in the end uh, that these bricks can be reused um, on the same space. And with that, of course, like history of the building is uh, living uh, further in, in the new uh, building. Also, like uh, that's also a very nice project uh, of uh, like a former office building, um, the yeah the old Vodafone uh, headquarter in Germany, um, where they, which is uh, in Düsseldorf or which was in Düsseldorf, and they have a lot of uh, nice office uh, um, materials in in the inside. So the outside it's uh, it's protected, so we can't change to anything. But the inside will be completely changed. So there will it's kind of retrofit, and so we digitized the materials, and we are now in the process of selling these materials with a very high quality. And uh, there we also work together with large manufacturers of materials because uh, we think uh, manufacturers play also an important role in the future of uh, recirculation of materials. In that case, we work with Lindner. Uh, Lindner is a very large uh, manufacturer for interior materials such as these office cubes, but also partition walls and so on. And um, so in the project before, but also in this project in Munich, um, there were materials from them. And what we did was to work with them together so that like basically uh, the materials is like establishing a take back system. So they are, um, they have the experts who are taking back the materials and then also deploy these materials at, uh, at the new client's uh, space. And with that, you can also give, uh, of course, the, the warranty or the guarantee of, of such materials as it's a manufacturer guarantee. Um, yeah, so like we also work with Interface or Stowe on, on, different, uh, on different projects. Um, very quickly also about the team. So we divided our team into uh, two areas. Um, on the digital side, we have Julius and myself. And on the construction side, we have uh, uh, Mark, who's uh, an architect for more than 30 years, has a lot of knowledge on the practical uh, um, aspects of 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 of, of construction construction site, and then Linda, she's a yeah well-known professor for circular construction at the RWH Aachen, and and um, also supports there on all the uh, new research which is happening there. And then of course, like a team uh, ranging from software engineers to architects, uh, engineers, and uh, and communication. And so you can also see a picture of some of the team and we were also already quite happy to, to be recognized in some competitions. And with that, um, thank you a lot for your attention. I hope that we can also uh, close the loop together in the construction sector and bring the construction sector further. And if you have any questions, uh, you're always free to, to reach out uh, to us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dominic. Fantastic presentation. And uh, also, thank you for sticking to the time. So we've got around five minutes for questions. Anyone wants to raise their hand off the first one? Yes. Um, who was? I don't know who was first, whether it was Alex or Katerini. I think it was Katerini. Okay, Katharina, please. Hi, um, thanks for the presentation. Um, I just wanted to ask you a question uh, regarding certification and warranties, uh, because um, in my understanding, when you go into repurposing materials, uh, this is one of the things you need to kind of look out. And how would the software be? Um, what is the software actually? 
taking into account in this process and uh, how how would we resolve this uh, legal let's say issue is this happening through the recertification and who is actually taking ultimately responsibility for the warranty of the new life yeah, thanks a lot for the question. I think also Juliet, uh, who's coming after me, can also tell a bit more about that because she's mm -hmm. directly involved in that. But um, speaking for Concula, so there are different ways of getting the recertification. One I already sh uh, showed was like going with the manufacturers. Very often the manufacturers are like we uh, also giving a certification again for the materials and then it's very easy warranty and so on. It's all about the manufacturers. Mm -hmm. um, but this is of course not always the case. Um, then like what we do, we define for every material group, like uh, is it a, a steel beam, is it a brick, is it a, a partition wall? For every uh, material group, we define like what uh, uh, checks or tests are necessary to um, to get a recertification. And then we also partner with institutions who are like independently can do these recertifications. And um, so, yeah, so like, and that you can all manage on our software. That is like a second um, uh, way. And um, a, a third one would be also to go via um, insurances. So there are some uh, insurance providers who give also insurance on a gar or on like a guarantee on, on, on construction materials. And uh, so, yeah, so they're, 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 they're different ways and it depends a bit on the material. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Alex, do you still have a question, Alex? Yes, sorry, someone just rang on my door, so I'll be real quick. Uh, uh, my question is, um, have you considered how your software could be used potentially for buildings that haven't been built yet? So, for example, I work at HEN, at HEN Architects, and obviously every building we build now or design now um, is uh, built with with like a BIM model first, right? So we have a digital twin. Uh, and would it be possible then to kind of analyze um, a design through your system to understand, for example, uh, how well it would work um, uh, potentially as a circular product? Yeah, so I'm not sure if I, I got the question right, but like first of all, what you can do is you can also create material passports on our system for new buildings. So with that, of course, um, you can already if I mean, in the lifetime of a building, there's a lot of change also of the materials in the building. So you can for example, after five years, you might change something in the interior. And so you can already sell these materials. So but like um, that is the one part. On the other side, if you're planning a new building, you can get access to our material database um, on Concola and there you can actually upload your BIM model. And then we are like automatically and sometimes also um, with some of our advisors trying to figure out like where can we where can we use reclaimed materials? So what do we have available uh, which can be now put in that uh, in that building? So. And there we always open to like discuss um, uh, with the project team where it makes sense to implement uh, these materials. I hope that is answering the question. Yes, yes, it does. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I was also muted. Sorry. Uh, yeah, Sabina, you had the, your hand up next. Yes. Um, thank you for the for the presentation. Um, I think it's a really important and interesting topic. Um, I would be interested, um, due to your experience, which are the materials um, which are well on the market to be reused? Um, is it like bricks? Is it like doors, um, tiles from the roof? Um, and then also what impact does the transportation have? Um, I did some research about reuse of concrete and I learned that it's um, it's used lots in road construction, but a big point is that, um, yeah, where is the demolition? Where is the plan for um, getting it ready for reuse? And then where's the new site? Um, is that something you look at or you consider in your software as well? Yeah, so starting maybe with the first question, so what are the most 
reused materials. So what I can say, like for example, doors and windows are sometimes very difficult because of the energy efficiency requirement. So like in a window which is 10 years old uh, or like 15 or 20 years old, it's very difficult to reuse. I mean, you can uh, do the glazing, you can do a new glazing and with that uh, you can maybe reach that, but then on the economical side, it's getting a bit difficult. Uh, but there's a lot of materials. Uh, it also depends. So like as as you said bricks uh, is very good a lot of the interior stuff obviously like uh, the uh, like partition walls like um uh, the flooring the, the things on the floor <laughs> the um, um uh, like indoors are very interesting but also facade elements uh, are very interesting also uh, a lot like staircases um it depends. Um, so there's a lot of materials. Also materials where you think uh, they are they can't be very easy reused, like heating. Also that's quite can be also reused quite often. Maybe not uh, again as like a heating um, um, element, but uh, maybe there, there's always some creativity which you can use. And uh, so that was the first question. And the second, um, sorry, what was it about? <laughs> Um, the transportation location ah, yeah. of demolition, um, yeah, yeah. Um, restoration, and then new site. Yeah, so we are uh, we have like an LCA model um, where we can calculate that. So where we know, okay, the material is right now at that location, and uh, it should be go to the other location. And if there's a negative CO2, uh, so like if you don't save, but it costs more CO2, and then compared to having a new material, we would not recommend it to you. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of materials um, where there where it's quite easy or like the CO2 um, or the yeah, these uh, THG emissions um, are still on the positive side. Uh, with concrete, the problem is a lot uh, that it's like very heavy and so on, and that's why it uh, also costs a lot on the transportation. But there's a lot of materials where this is not the case. So yeah. So most of the materials are quite positive also if you transport them more than 300, 400 kilometers. But still, of course, we try to do like a local reuse. That's why we also in like the large cities. Um, but yeah, most of the materials can be also transported quite far away. Okay, thanks. Um, I see we have three more questions, but I'd like to if possible, we'll carry, give uh, Juliet enough time to present. Do you do you guys think you can uh, keep them for the end? Jordan, Oliver, and Anne? Okay, yep, I see the hands going down. Thanks. Uh, you get priority after, after Juliet's presentation. So with that, I'd like to uh, introduce our next speaker. Um, Juliet is um, the material manager at Transform and responsible for the implementation of circular construction together with her team. Uh, Transform, EG, is a building cooperative in Berlin, Neukölln, that is implementing circular construction. This means that we reuse and repurpose used buildings and build in such a way that components can be reused again in the future. The cooperative takes on the task of planning and structural implementation of projects and always acts with and for the user projects. Uh, Juliet, thanks for joining us. Um, thanks a lot for the invitation. It's a pleasure. So I'm directly on site because it's Monday and Monday is delivery time. So I'm the whole day on the construction site, but it's good. It's like in situ. Um, so I'm, I'm going to present also my PowerPoint. It's just like this. Um, is it working? Not yet. No. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay, I'm 
it do it doesn't work, so oh. I don't know what is going on. Could you send if you send it to me, I could try to present it. Otherwise, I, I don't think I can give you any further rights to, to present. Mm. <sighs> OK. <laughs> Technical problem. So I'm, I'm just going to send it to you. OK. Um, in the meantime, maybe we can take one more question for Dominic. Um, I believe, Jaren, you are next. Okay, yeah. Thanks for the very interesting presentation. I have a question. Um, are you planning to collaborate also with Madasta that was recently launched in Germany in the future? Because they are like yeah. Yeah, yeah, thanks a lot for the question. Um, yeah, so maybe also for everyone, so like where's the difference between Madasta and, and Concola? So Madasta is basically uh, an inventory for material passports, uh, where we see us as more like an ecosystem, right? Uh, we also do uh, material passports, but uh, it's just one part. We, we think it needs a complete ecosystem so that the reuse is really possible. So you should also not only document the materials, but you should be able to, to also sell them or bring them into a new project. Um, so we are partnering with Madasa in a way that is possible to like, uh, to have like um, uh, the possibility to take the materials which are in Madasta also to Concola and vice versa. Uh, yes, so maybe that is answering the question. Um, yeah, and whereas we are more more focusing on the reuse, uh, Madasta uh, on the reuse and especially on existing buildings, Madasta is more focusing on new buildings. Yeah. Have we lost Juliet or is she back? I'm back, sorry. Oh, hi. I, no worries. I've been rejected somehow and now I'm oh, back okay. again. Um, I haven't received your presentation yet. Maybe it's still uh, on the way. Mm. Would you, could you, tr have you tried to share again? Ah, yes, we can see your screen now. Okay, that's great. So now I can present. <laughs> Sorry for the delay. Do you see everything? Uh, yes. So, um, yeah, so we are Transform. We are um, a building cooperative from Berlin Neukölln that is building in Berlin Neukölln. Um, so I think I'm just going to present quickly um, who we are because the structure of the cooperative is quite relevant to understand how we can manage to um, build circular and to do to experiment everything we are we are doing here. Um, so um, the building cooperative is. Um, planning with and for the users. Um, so it means that we don't actually um, follow a third party interest. Um, we are basically building as much um, um, sustainable and um, I don't know, uh, as much sustainable as possible for the users and also um, not too costly for the users because we um, try to offer um, cheap rent or rent that is not getting too high with the time, which is in Berlin a very relevant topic. Um, so yeah, we are also expert building owner and also building team. So we try to renew a little bit this hierarchy in the construction sector. It's sometimes difficult and sometimes a little bit chaotic, but it's also very interesting because we have a, a lot of um, 
uh, we can we can take all the financial decisions and also all the implementation decisions. So it gives us a lot of space, a lot of room to implement a lot of things. So we are a team of specialist planners, architects and engineers and also creative workers. Since last year, September, we also decided to work on the construction site and to build ourselves a lot of things. Um, so yeah, we take on partial services when it makes sense because it's still complicated today to find companies that are actually wishing to um, build with reuse materials or that that um, that are um, taking on responsibilities with these materials. So yeah, we for some for some uh, construction tasks we decided to do it ourselves, and uh, we also. Um, took on the construction supervision for some reasons um, and some um, planning tasks as well. But we are also working together with other office um, like Kapaneto and Schoening and Die Zusammenarbeiter. Um, so um, I'm going to try to make it short, but why do we build circular? I think it's a very important question. and. Dominic already um, presented it very good, so I'm not going to repeat. But um, we have nearly the same uh, the same numbers. So uh, the construction sector is very very dirty sector. Um, it uses more than um, it uses 40% of the energy consumption in Europe and 35% uh, of the material in the world. And um, on the top of that is also wasting the whole at the end of the chain. So it's a it's a little bit of a shame, and we want to just to, to change that and to show that it is actually possible. And how is it possible? Um, and we are um, renovating and building new. We have two projects, but uh, we are focusing on the renovation. And this allows us, as this concept also allows us to uh, be creative at some point. And I think now that a lot of people are coming to join us and to work with us, it's for them not only building circular because they want to save resources it's also because they want to build creative somehow and i think this is quite relevant now because um it's all about finding uh, creative solutions on site and sometimes the workers the construction workers are not coming to us because of the environment they're also coming to us because they just want to build the way they want and they are not asked to do that in some other companies and then a last point is the question of the cost is still a question because I don't think we can say right now that we are um, that it's less costly to build circular, but uh, we are also sure that um, it's going to be less costly when a lot of projects are doing it and when a lot of companies are involved and when logistic is also getting uh, less costly because they know how to handle this, they know how to handle the materials, they know how to reduce the cost and to offer a cheaper or a, a good a good offer for a cheaper price. Because right now I think circular construction is still a niche and it's quite difficult to find yeah to find um, companies that wish to work with us for a normal price, let's say. But it's the goal. So let's see at the end of the project. Um, and now I'm going to present the project. So um, we do have two projects, one new building and one renovation. I'm going to focus on the renovation because this is um, where we experiment everything. So it's the circular house, how um, Dominic also presented it. It's a very big industry building. <laughs> so um, for those who live in Berlin, it's situated on the um, Kinderbrewery area. It's, between, it's in Berlin, Neukölln. And it used to be actually attached to the brewery before. Um, and it used to be a storage place and also a place for the workers to take showers or to store the beer. Um, so the building is, um, is made of um, two levels. I'm showing you right now the different, the, the, the very basic design. So um, you can see the lower level here and the upper level. Somehow both levels are accessible from the street or from the, from the area. Because if you look on the southern facade, here's the street and it's actually the, and the lower level. But you can get in with the doors right here and the building is built on a slope. And here's the upper level, it's like a big hole. Um, 
And on the top of it, we also built a, a flat roof because we're going to extend the structure. We're going to add some additional flows. Um, so here you can see the additional flows. You can also understand better maybe the, the design of the, of the structure. So you have this lower space with six rooms and then the, the upper space, this big hall with the gallery floor that we are so right now building. So it's going to be a wooden gallery floor uh, linked with staircases here everywhere. And then on the top, uh, it's still in the planning phase, but we're going to add two and a half floors. Um, yeah, and it's going to start the construction of the extension is going to start in, Jul in July. So, um, yeah, I'm also going to um, show a little bit the process, the construction process, uh, the renovation process. So we started um, in 2019. We already got all the materials that were here out of the building and we decided to store it directly on site next to the building outside um, because the building was already full of a lot of materials, like old materials, but they are still good. And we already took it as a start. So we wanted to plan all the materials again as much as possible and keep the structure. So um, last year in 2020, um, yeah, in 2020, sorry for the slides. I don't know, they're not following me. Um, we took the, we disassembled the, the, the roof uh, in order to build this flat roof on the top of it and to be able to build to build the extension. Um, you can see also that we, um, we, we built some big beams in the middle so that the extension is also um, staying on, on the structure. So it was quite a long process and now we are um, so far that we are actually working on the interior insulation and the renovation and also building the gallery floor. As you can see um, on the image, the gallery floor started today, so it's a very updated image because it's from today morning. Um, yeah, so this is the this is where we are right now, and um, the slide, yeah. So in November this year, we hope if we are not too late that we can um, open the building and. Um, yeah, so here is the same place that you can see, but uh, in the future, and it's going to be this gallery, this wooden gallery again um, in this big hall. And uh, Impact Hub is going to be our users. Um, and yeah, they're going to just um, install co working spaces, event spaces. They are also focusing on circular economy, which is super interesting. And on the lower level, it's going to be workshops and um, more like hand. hand um, hand workplaces where people are going to work on circular economy or reusing materials actually. And from July 2021 on we are starting the extension of the building so maybe here you can have a better a better ima image in, in your head of how it's going to look like so you can see the bricks here, the, the red bricks, the original structure and on the top of it um, these two and a half floors. Um, the building uh, is going to offer some working spaces, so in the lower floor and in the um, first floor and on the top of it, um, it's going to be mainly co-working space, um, sorry, mainly co-housing spaces, so apartments, living space. So now I think I'm going to just talk a little bit about the, how, how we are building actually, which is interesting. Um, I'm going to start with the construction team. Why? Because I think that the construction team is the key. So we created a team last year in September. We call it the Collective Baustelle, so the Collective Construction Team. We used to be five until February and now we are 20. So um, it's getting quite big. And um, the construction team is building the reuse material for the reuse materials for us. Um, and we take on, they are also part of Transform and we take on the whole responsibility of building the materials again. Um, they have been um, undertaken some different tasks in the building. Um, they, haven't not, they have not uh, done the structure because we have a structural constructor. 
that is doing that for us, but they are doing, for example, the interior insulation, the windows, we decided to build the whole windows ourselves. Here you can see our workshop. We installed a whole workshop directly um, in the construction site in the lower level where I am right now. Um, and we are building everything from here. Um, we are, they are also focusing on the ground, so they are going to work on the ground. It's a very old concrete ground, so it's quite difficult to handle. Um, they are also working on the doors. They are working uh, also on the gallery floor, as I said, and they will be uh, so um, building. Yeah, I think I think that's all, um, and doing some different tasks. Um, and I think the construction team, uh, so we are like different, some are architects, some are just uh, construction workers, some are uh, coming from different sectors and have different knowledges. And uh, it's very interesting because they are uh, quite good in problem solving. They are also finding a lot of solutions directly on site uh, with the materials that is on site and with what is left over from our um, structural constructor with what is left over from the new building on the other side of the area um, and they are really uh, developing this capacity of finding solutions and alternatives with what it is with what is there um, so yeah i think the construction team is the key uh, and that's also the reason why we implemented or we're trying to implement this new hierarchy because I think such a concept can only work when all the people are planning together and when we use also the knowledge from the construction team because they have the experience and I think a lot of people do not know what material can be used in some places or in some other places but the construction workers they they know they've been doing that their whole life and if they have to find an alternative they just do it so it's really interesting to work with them they are very involved in the planning phase um yeah and um at transform we have three guidelines um first of all we build with use components of course so we reuse everything that we have on site but we also integrate materials and components from existing buildings where they are not no, no longer needed. So in Berlin, we, we've got a lot of materials from buildings in Berlin, buildings that were refurbished after five years of use, where you have like a lot of materials that are uh, still in a very good shape. And if you don't take it, they're probably going to be in the landfills. So that's what we do. We are also taking... Um, materials and components from Germany, from Switzerland uh, sometimes, from the Netherlands as well, but we try to stay in a, in a small area, or <laughs> at least in those four countries, because otherwise it would be too inefficient to transport the materials, and it would also not be interesting for the ecological footprint. Um, so yeah, and it's enough in Berlin because it's so many so many buildings getting uh, destroyed here and deconstructed. I think it's quite a lot of materials already. <laughs> so um, the second guideline of us is designing for this assembly. This means that we don't only um, use reuse components, but we also try to install them in a way that they can be in the future in 30 years, 40 years, again reused. And it means that they have to be um, removable. So um, it's not all the time easy. Um, we also made the experience with the windows because we uh, decided to build the windows ourselves uh, out of a wood frame and a big glassing, like a very big glass uh, panel. And um, we already like um, had the experience, okay, how can such a big glass panel be removed easily? I don't know. Uh, but we try to, um, for example, to focus on the connections. We are screwing, using a lot of screws. Um, yeah, and trying to make the best out of it. I think it's all about a trade-off. It's also not like we're not going to use only uh, reuse materials. We are also buying, of course, new materials in order to install those reuse components. But um, we always make a trade-off. And when we choose new materials because it makes sense, because it's also more efficient or because a lot of um, components have very short, um, uh, very strict measurements and there it's really not easy to find a reuse component uh, 120 times that is fitting perfectly to the 
to the measurement. Um, so, of course, in this case, we buy new. But when we do that, we also try to um, focus on uh, healthy materials so that in the future we have a better impact, a better ecological footprint. Like a, we try to, let's say, to build a positive building. Um, and this is quite um, this is quite obvious in our in interior insulation. For example, we focus on alternative materials like like clay, like hemp, like um, yeah something like a substitute um, a substitute for, for for concrete. Uh, we try to focus also on some new panels. Um, yeah, it's all about a trade-off. So it's not only a patchwork of reuse material, it's also, of course, new materials are brought here, but all in the, like, we are also trying um, to make it possible with this big amount of reuse material. Um, so here I have a really interesting poster. We really like it with the team because it's quite, um, it's making a good sum up of what we are focusing on. Um, I, I, I took three points that I think are relevant in our strategy, in our methods. Um, first of all, find some creative solutions directly on site. Um, that's what I was saying with the, about, the, about the construction team, is that they have this capacity of finding creative solutions with what is there and what is working in the context. And I think this is very specific. So you can't basically, of course, we have big guidelines and, and tips, but I think it all depends on the context and on the structure. If you're renovating, you have to get inspired by the structure. And of course, the purpose is to keep the, the whole of the structure. And sometimes it's very difficult to find something that fits and that works. And we have also... Uh, we experiment this as well in the installation of a lot of materials because we, I don't know, when you take, for example, um, a facade, uh, um, a glass from a from a facade, and that you want to install it inside, and that you have to find an attached system. Um, it's not only sometimes we just find something and then put it on the wall and it fits. Okay, then we buy um, 300 packages of this. But at the beginning, we found it on the construction site. So it's often um, happening like this. And the second is the second tip is think about the connections and the accessibility. Accessibility. Um, this is also very important. And that's what I was saying also with the attach. I think the connections, like we're using really a lot of screws, and it's good because you can unscrew it and it's easy and it's accessible and everybody can do it with a normal tool. So you don't need a big machine to break to break, to break some some kind of um, glue or um, that is also binding the material with the structure forever, or, and then you have to. Um, get everything out and then it's breaking the material. This is the case very often with, with tiles, for example. Um, and the accessibility, um, I think it's also very important in a lot of buildings. Um, you don't have access actually to the surface or to, to the material directly that is to repair or to be removed. Um, and for example, in the building, we also decided to install everything surface mounted. So it's called off puts. Um, it's very relevant for the pipelines, for the electricity installation, for the um, yeah, for the gas and electricity installation, um, so that the people who are going to fix it have directly access to the screws, for example, and don't have to break a cavity or a wall before that. Um, yeah. And it, uh, it's also quite relevant for from an educational point of view because then really um, how is a building actually um, installed and what is in the building and what is it making, uh, how is it working? And I think that's also quite relevant. Um, and the last point that I want to highlight is document your work. Keep proof. Um, Dominic also said that um, that the documentation was right now not so not not like a it, it's not so often that you find documentation about the building or the material that is built and for us that we are who are um, disassembling a lot of materials in Berlin it's sometimes very difficult because we actually don't know how this material has been brought here and how is it 
installed. So we spend a lot of time and a lot of effort just finding out. Um, and I think right now um, we are also spending a lot of time thinking about our documentation, how the building is going to be documented. Um, so we try for all this this uh, this task like doors, the the doors, the the windows, the insulation, and so on. We try to do, to make a big documentation uh, with shims, with pictures, with um, explanation. How did we put it inside? How how like some tips or so? How should you um, get the glass out of the frame? with what tools, what materials, the quantity of materials that has been installed here, the quantities of screws, what you should uh, be aware of. Um, yeah, it can take like a lot of, it can be under a lot of formats, but I think it's super relevant. And right now we are really working on it. I think wow. it's a, also a very big job. And um, having a person here on the construction site available for the documentation and focusing on the documentation I think is also really important. Also for the document for the materials and the planning of the materials because you always have to go between the construction site, the laptop and the material to try to find out if this material can be planned here or here and then um, make the ping pong between the static engineer and some other people who are also trying to plan this material. So you have to have a big digitalized, if possible, documentation about all your materials. Um, yeah, I think that's um, okay for our strategy. And now I'm also gonna um, talk about our main challenges because we don't have any successes here. We also have problems. Um, but we are working on solutions. So um, the first point that I want to say is material sourcing and uncertain team. Material sourcing, um, I think we are working a lot on this with Dominic. Um, so where can we find reuse materials in a fitting quantity and in a short time? Um, I think that's still a challenge, but we, we try to um, find a lot of sources. Um, first of all, check what is on your construction site because it's often a lot of materials that are just too um, often um, um, delivered, too often uh, bought and uh, you have a too uh, a big quantity of them and uh, it's very often that normal companies and structural builder, for example, they don't use all of it and then they just uh, so get rid of it with the rest with the um, little pieces. Um, so do, just first of all, check on what is here and then check also, I think we also see a lot of different construction sites in the street in Berlin or just um, getting on a bike and making a tour of the city, you will get a lot of, a lot of inspiration. Um, but the problem is that um, it's very difficult to find in a fitting time and fitting quantity. Um, and I think that's also one of the main reasons why uh, why circular construction is today not so far in uh, the construction sector is because it brings uncertainty and you have a very strict timeline in construction projects. You probably know uh, it, all of you. Um, and it's difficult. You can't say, hey, I, maybe I need four weeks to find this door or maybe I need two months, I don't know. Um, maybe I don't find it at all. Um, and I think this is an uncertainty that a uh, few people want to agree with, to agree on. Um, so yeah, I think we had the chance also here to have a very um, easy and, and relaxed timeline, let's say. Right now we are so quite hurrying up, but um, and for some components, it's also okay. For stairs, for example, they a lot of people are saying, okay, you can find the stairs in six months. If you don't find it, then we find another solution. Another solution. Or for some components, it's just too um, too quick and too too difficult to find. Then we just say, okay, we just bring it new. Uh, it's all about the trade-off, as I said. Um, and yeah. I think um, it's all also about the flexibility of the planning. So we are trying to be uh, as flexible as possible. 
um, try to find, we try to find the materials before or so, and we try to just take the materials that we really need. So for example, if we know that we have a certain um, like flexible measurements for some materials, for some windows, and they are going to be installed in about a year, we have a lot of chance to find this material and to pass it to, to, to make it fit into the planning because we're still in the planning phase. This is what we are doing, for example, with the extension. Um, we are already searching materials for the, for the extension since a year or something, and the, it's still in the planning phase. So we have a lot of um, flexibility here. Um, and then somehow it's also happening a lot that we have materials, we want to take it, because it's a very good material, it's available in big quantity, we don't have a plan for it, and then it's a trade-off. Um, we just think, okay, we actually don't have a position for the material, but we can find one, and then we are working in a very short time. Again, it's a problem of time, because the material is available, maybe tomorrow it's already gone, or already sold to another person who has interest, and then you have to decide in about 24 hours if you want to buy those materials or not. Um, and sometimes you have to say no. Unfortunately, we we have been saying no to a lot of materials because we can't take everything. It's sad and sometimes it hurts to to say this very good quality material going away and thinking that maybe it's just going to end up in the landfills. But um, we also can't take everything and invest a lot of time and money in materials that are going to be leftovers at some point. And it's also not the purpose. So um, I think to not be too optimistic with materials and components that are not fitting quite well to the design is very important. And we've made the mistake and we are still making the mistake and we will still make the mistake of taking components, doors, I don't know, we made the mistake with doors, um, which are really good and really good quality, but they don't really fit. But it's okay, we're going to find a solution. We're going to just... Uh, improvise a frame for the door, but actually it's just too costly and it's also too complicated and then the doors are leftovers. And you've been investing a lot of energy and a lot of money in getting these doors to the construction site. So yeah, don't be too optimistic. <laughs> um, but the good Sorry, thing is that... um, just a time check if you can start yeah. wrapping up, please. Thank you. Um, yeah, so the question of the storage, I think, is also very relevant. We have been the chance to store directly on the construction site. It would have been really impossible to get a storage far away uh, because of the transport, because it's very costly and it's a lot of time and um, energy invested in transport. So we got this chance, um, but please store dry. Like we also store a lot of components outside and uh, with the water and the winter, it's sometimes difficult. So you have to, it's a it's a difficult part challenge, kind of a fitting solution. Um, yeah, and uh, it was also in the questions which components are easily reusable, which are more complicated. I think Dominic also said that um, every component that can be modified is good to take, like glass, steel, wood, panels, plates, stones. It's uh, easy to modify, easy to work with, easy to install in different positions. The things that are also ready to install and easy to process, like stairs, ceramic, it's very easy to wash and very e and also standard and standard components like toilets, for example. It's a bit disgusting, but it's very easy to reuse and they are standard. They're always the same kind of. Um, and then the things that are, the components that are a little bit more difficult, also Dominic said it, it's about windows, doors, components with requirement. Um, yeah, like fire safety, static, and um, I don't know, waterproofing is very difficult. So um, yeah, this is something we still don't have a solution for that. And the last challenge is about the warranty, as you also asked in the question. Um, I think this is also a process. We are working with the producers um, and with um, some, uh, some external companies that can install the difficult materials, like the fire safety doors, for example, for us, and um, give us a, a warranty, actually. Uh, like the, the producer is giving a warranty because he knows that the company has been doing it 
um, good and because it's um, because it's a it's it's like an expert company. So yeah, and then I had some just some images. Have to say many more, but yeah, it's just about what we do. So it's just uh, like some reuse cases. We took facet facet granite plates and we use it for the for the ground, for example, in the sanitary. Then we took also facet um, glass and we use it as a wall cladding, um, as an example. And we also improvise improvise with the with the um, the attach. And then we also made our dolls out of reuse components completely out of what was on the construction site um, with wood, with um, uh, styrodor like insulation. Uh, with reused dolls or dolls that we install in a new frame, yeah, they look very rock and roll. But um, it's all about like this, this, this. All these materials were already on the construction site, and we just cut it and uh, polished it and installed it again in a new component. So yeah, that's um, examples of what we do. So with windows that we are installing right now, old windows that we got from Switzerland. Um, yeah, just some images. Uh, so toilets that we got from another co um, construction site and that we are building again in our construction site. So yeah, that was it. Um, I was a little bit short with time. Sorry, I was too long. But here also my contact information. And um, yeah, just contact me. I'm happy if you contact me.